Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you so much for having us today. We look forward to having um, an engaging discussion with, um, with the group today. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, um, so, um, so Sarah and I are here today to talk about ethical um, research with children and young people. Um, sorry. Okay, perfect. Uh, before we do that, uh, we just wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. Uh, we pay our respects to elders and past, present and emerging and recognize and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and waters of New South Wales. Um, so, so we thought um, we'd just provide you with uh, a brief background about um, the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network, um, which is where Sarah and I work. Um, so the SCHN um, incorporates um, uh, six different services, um, including the Children's Hospital at Westmead, um, Sydney Children's Hospital at Randwick, um, Kids Research um, Nets, so that's um, uh, the newborn emergency transport services, um, Bear Cottage, which is um, a palliative care service for children, and uh, the Children's Court Clinic in Parramatta. Um, the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network, HREC, um, is a lead HREC um, under the National Mutual Acceptance Scheme, and um, we review applications from um, public and private sites anywhere in Australia, and we're also the, um, the Specialist Early Phase Clinical Trials Ethics Committee for Pediatrics in um, New South Wales. Um, SEHN, um, as an organization, is a research active um, organization uh, with a strong interest in advanced therapeutics. Um, advanced therapeutics are a new class of medicines that are based on genes, cells, or tissues, um, and they have the potential to treat um, diseases and injury that um, currently have limited treatment options or no options at all. Um, and advanced therapeutics can be classified as either gene therapy product, um, somatic cell therapy products, tissue engineered um, products, or the phage therapy products. I can never, like, it's phage or phage. Um, um, I have heard different pronunciations of that product. <laughs> um, so just the heads up for the group. Um, uh, so that's us, an introduction. Um, throughout this presentation, we will be asking you questions. And uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could engage with the presentation, because that would be more, um, I guess, um, engaging um, and enjoyable um, experience, I hope. Uh, please feel free also, um, like even if we haven't asked the question, if there is any slide that you have a question about or if you would like to make a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and speak or, you know, um, use the chat um, function. So before we get into the actual presentation about ethical research with children and young people, we were interested in how you define a child, like how, from your point of view or from your experience. Um, how do you define a child? There's no wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> do you want people to speak or to put in the chat? Uh, whatever works for them. Whatever okay. they feel. Like. Yeah. For me, it feels a bit like uh, bef uh, just sort of pregnancy to 18 years. Right. We also in the chat have somebody who's saying a legal minor. Right. Okay. Anyone else? All right. It's okay. We'll we'll move on. Hopefully That's right. We'll... Oh, sorry. I was gonna. I can't type in. It's Pamela. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? This is lovely. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you. So, yeah, the, the, I mean, it's a really, it is an interesting question and there is no wrong um, answer. And we always say at St. Vincent's, and this is sometimes, you know, something we struggle, not struggle with, but we question. So we approve for, um, we don't approve for children. 
because uh, we don't have the expertise and we always we define a child by anyone less than 18 years of age however uh, you know anything from 14 to 18 there are shades of gray both legally from a privacy perspective etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, it is a very interesting discussion and and i'd be I, i'm interested to, to hear you know what your thoughts are and um how we get you know how others define it so thank you Right, um, there's also more in the chat, which is below the legal age or below the age of puberty and under 12 years. Right, okay. I'm not sure why I was muted, <laughs> but I got a message saying I was muted. <laughs> but um I was saying I'm so glad that um, we have different definitions because I guess that's reflected also um, in reality, to be honest, in in um, uh, in practice. Um, so the legal definition of um, a child actually differs in different states of Australia, unfortunately, but like um, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, so, for example, in um, in New South Wales, actually, um, a child is defined as anyone under the age of 16 um, in the in Section 3 of the Children and Young Persons Act. Whereas in Queensland, um, a child is defined as anyone under the age of 18. So that makes it a bit challenging, especially when ethics committees review um, applications for studies that involve multiple states um, because the legal definition differs. Um, and the other layer of complexity is actually the age-based um, definition of child actually incorporates a wide range of children and young people um, that um, have different life experiences. And, you know, there are different cultural practices, um, uh, you know, in different cultures. And, um, yeah, so all of that kind of uh, means that, you know, um, we have children of various levels of maturity and understanding um, at different ages. Um, like for example, you could have two children the same age, say for example, 12 or 13, and one of them has had a chronic condition since you know they were um, a little baby or like you know they've grown up in, grown up in a different culture. And then the other one has been, you know, healthy in, um, in a different culture, like they would have different um, levels of, you know, um, experience and, you know, maturity and, um, I guess, um, understanding um, of um, research requirements when you speak to them. So it's, it's important when designing or reviewing research project that this is taken into um, consideration. Like, um, again, an, another example, um, and Sarah, please feel free to jump, jump in um, to comment. Um, so say if um, you get an information sheet for a clinical trial, you know, um, in, in a population who has been, you know, for example, um, CF, you know, the child has been having this condition for a long time. When you get a child information sheet, you know, um, you have a different type of review. Like, you know, this child understands more about this condition than perhaps, um, you know, someone um, like me who, you know, who hasn't um, experienced that condition, but is older than them. So like, you kind of have to think about um, the population and their experience and their background and not just think about the age of um, the participants. Uh, so can um, I just ask, somebody in the chat has asked, does it include children pre-birth? Um, that's a really good um, question. Um, uh, I that hasn't, to be honest, we don't get a lot of um, applications involving pregnant women. So that hasn't, and or like, you know, sorry, not a pregnant woman. I, we don't get applications involving fetuses, like, you know, um, sorry, I'm not saying that right. But I, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure. I don't think that actually legally includes them, the definition. Sarah, do you have any? Um, I, I actually don't know about that. We haven't faced anything. We do get studies with neonatals, but we've never had anything which is actually done on the fetus. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it does include um, after birth. And I, I don't know what the legal definition is there. Sorry. Sorry. Anything else, Meredith, before we move on? Uh, does it not depend on purpose, e.g. a legal minor for consent? I'm not sure if you covered that one. So um, 
so in research, um, and we'll go through that in the next few, um, like in the slides coming up. Um, so the, like, do you mean the definition? Like, what does the question exactly, like, does the so definition? Andrew, Andrew might want to unmute and, and have a chat with you, Andrew. Sorry, um, I was just saying that um, when you're approaching the question of a, a child, um, who, who falls within the definition, isn't it sort of framed by reference to why you're working, trying to work out whether a person is a child or not? And that from, I know from a legal point of view, we tend to look at it from the point of view of whether the individual can give consent or not, um, which I would say would take out um, people who haven't been born because they're not in a position to give consent. But right. I would strictly think without looking at the legislation, typically we'd say anybody under the age of 18 as they can't give legal consent. But it, it, it depends on what they can give consent to would define whether they're a child or not. And I was just trying to phrase it that way, it depends what purpose you're looking at. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, that was good. Um, Okay, anything else in the chat, Merrily, before I move on? Good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess the key message from this slide is that are legal definitions of a child, um, but also like, you know, when designing information sheets, I guess, and how children are engaged in the decision making process, it's important to also look at, um, you know, the, you know, the context and um, the background of the children. Um, in terms of um, historical context, um, so involving children in research is actually not um, a novel concept. They've been actually involved in medical research for hundreds of years, um, and they've been kind of um, viewed as conveniently available subjects. Um, the painting there actually is um, showing um, Edward Jenner um, administering the first smallpox vaccine um, to um, a child named James Phillip, uh, sorry, James Phipps. Um, and that was done in 1796. Um, so even though children have been involved in research um, for hundreds of years, unfortunately, the ethical guidelines on involving children and young people in research um, hasn't evolved as timely as those in the adult world. Uh, for example, when the Nuremberg Code um, was released in 1947, which had like the first set of guidelines for medical research in terms of ethics, there was actually no mention of children in that. Um, it wasn't until the declaration of Helsinki in 1964 where children were mentioned. Um, and that was um, uh, kind of a mention of children requiring permission, uh, permission from the, the responsible relative replace that of the subject. So as the ethical guidelines in um, you know, human research uh, and medical research was evolving, Increasingly, um, children were actually um, being viewed as vulnerable subjects to be excluded, or sorry, to be protected from the risks of research. Unfortunately, um, that sense of protection actually um, led um, to negative consequences for children because they were, they were being excluded from a lot of research projects, and that actually ended up in lack of uh, safety and effectiveness data. So a lot of the, you know, interventions and medications were being um, developed um, as a result of research with adults, and they were just kind of being transferred for use in, in, in the pediatric um, population without any further research um, uh, to assess their safety and efficacy for children and young people. Um, the legacy of that actually is still here today. There's a lot of off-label um, prescribing um, uh, happening in the pediatric world, um, uh, especially in the neonatal intensive care, that's definitely decreasing as more research is coming, but it's still there um, in, like, um, as a result. Fortunately, now in the medical research and health research world, um, it is agreed that pediatric research is essential and actually morally imperative. Um, because there is a recognition that uh, a recognition now that children and young people are not small adults. They, you know, they differ physically and mentally from adults, um, and they react differently to medications, devices, and other interventions. Um, uh, in fact, the pharmacokinetic processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion actually changes also within the pediat pediatric population. 
due to growth and development so that you know like um you see sometimes in clinical trials they have like you know older children as a cohort and younger children as a cohort so I think it's good that there is that recognition now um and the other thing is that there are childhood diseases that um actually um unfortunately children don't like children who have those diseases don't actually reach adulthood um so there there are you know um none or like few adults with that condition so research is not really you know possible in adults um having that condition um and so like so one in 12 baby babies are born with a rare disease and there are uh, there are more than 6000 rare diseases um at the moment um uh, and 75% of those affect um, children, um, and unfortunately, 30% of those will actually die before they are five years old. Um, and um, with those rare diseases, unfortunately, um, for many children, there's actually no treatment at the moment. So, um, so all of that kind of, um, I guess, shows why it's so important to have research in the pediatric population and not exclude them. Um, I guess another question for, for the group. Um, so we had the discussion about how children and young people, um, you know, were viewed as vulnerable and therefore, you know, um, excluded before from research. Um, so what, what do you think um, were the reasons that children and young people were considered vulnerable when participating in research? Why do you think they would be vulnerable? Because they don't understand the implications and the risks associated. Yep. Yes. Anyone else? Hi, it's Andrew. I, I was just saying, picking up your point earlier, is that children react differently to medicines or pharmaceuticals and devices um, that are yep. being used to treat them so they have a different reaction to adults. Yep. There's, there's a few people in the chat who I think um, you probably summarise as, you know, the power imbalance. So we've got people saying they can be taken advantage of, there's less control over their lives, they're too shy to speak up. As well yep. as that, there are ones, uh, so people saying lack of ability to make decisions for themselves, and, and easier to be coerced by adults. Yeah, that's very impressive. You basically covered my next slide. <laughs> um, any other comments before I actually move on to the next slide? Okay, um, so I think um, this is very uh, reassuring. I think you all got it very right. So the, uh, there are four reasons um, as to why um, they are considered to be vulnerable. Uh, one is that, you know, um, children and young people are still in the process of cognitive and emotional development, so there might be limitations there. Um, and so their decision-making capabilities, understanding of complex concepts, uh, and ability to assess risks may not be fully developed. Um, and so this may make it difficult for them to provide informed consent for their own participation. The other thing is, which was also picked up by the, or like um, uh, raised by the, uh, the group, is the power imbalance. Um, so children and young people uh, actually may perceive researchers as authority figures, especially if the researcher is also their treating clinician. Um, and so this can actually create a power imbalance and influence their willingness to ask questions or raise concerns, or even like, you know, um, you know it would make them, I guess, um, uh, un, you know, uncomfortable to, if they don't want to participate in the research, they wouldn't feel as comfortable to bring that up. And so they would feel pressured to participate, even if they are unsure on, or uncomfortable. Um, and also emotionally, uh, being emotionally vulnerable, um, children and young people may be more emotionally sensitive or susceptible to distress caused by certain research topics um, or procedures. And so they might um, find it challenging to cope with the emotional impact of participating in research, um, especially if it involves sensitive or personal issues. Um, and then the other thing is parental or um, guardian influence. Um, so because, you know, um, often um, it is required that parent and guardian pr provide consent for their participation. Um, there might be influence and undue pressure on that end as well. And I guess if you've got the parent and the, you know, the adult researcher slash clinician 
kind of, you know, making um, the decision for participation and like having those conversations, it's very easy for the voice of the child or young person to get lost in that um, setting. Okay, so we'd like to actually go through a case study with you. So I'll go through the case study now, and then we'll have a discussion um, about um, the case study. Um, so our case study here is about an adolescent um, who's been invited to take part in research without parental consent. And so we'll be exploring um, consent to research versus consent for other activities. And I hope that what we covered will help the will help inform the discussions we're having. So our our case um, here is a young person who is fourteen year old with depression. The young person does not want to discuss his depression um, and problems with his parents, and um, he seeks help from a community health center. On his first visit, he's provided with counseling and asked to return for a second visit, where the possibility of medication will be discussed with him. And he is reassured that his parents um, do not have to be involved um, with, with um, whatever they're doing. Now, researchers from the center um, invite this young person to participate in a, a randomized control trial for depression, investigating a new drug. Um, and the researchers say that um, parental consent is not needed for the young person to get um, treatment, so they should not need uh, parental consent for his participation in the research. Um, so I guess this is what we want to discuss. I'll hand over to Sarah um, from here on. And thanks, Ezra. So um, I suppose the first question we want to pose to you is the researcher's view correct? And I think, Pamela, this may tie into something that you were getting at earlier. So is, um, is, is the researcher's view correct? Can this person participate uh, in research at the age of 14 without parental consent? The fact that he, I think, at least in New South Wales, of my understanding, again, it's one of those things that does differ from state to state, that between 14 and 16, somebody can participate, uh, somebody can accept their own treatment or have clinical treatment without parental knowledge. Um, but what about the research? Does anybody want to make a comment? Well, medication is a is a type of invasive um, intervention. You know, it's um, consumed, and so I would think that that level of invasiveness and the risks associated with that with that would mean that the child was um, not really able to to um, give informed consent of the yeah you know, of the nature of that that intervention and the, the risks. I think for treatment they can, and I, and I think that is something that that has got to be sort of tied up. I mean, they always use the Gillick competency as what the doctors are meant to be using, but I think certainly for fourteen to sixteen year olds in New South Wales, I think it's older or younger in the Northern Territory and older in all other states. But as far as treatment goes, if the doctor considers the child, the child or the young person to be um, between fourteen and sixteen, they can um, accept treatment. Yeah, um, but I'm thinking about it in the context of research. So, yeah, so it's an invasive intervention in the context of an experimental process. Um, absolutely. That's what absolutely. I think changes that, yeah. Absolutely. Um, does anybody else want to make comments? We've got um, we, we, have got, we have a couple of hands up. Yeah. Oh, hi, Amine. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Sorry. So I was going to say that I think the, the primary difference is about what where the need is. So, you know, a patient needs their treatment and yes. they don't need to be part of research. And so, you know, you can give consent to something that you need because it's actually part of your healthcare needs. Um, whereas that's completely different to the research because the researchers need the participants. They, <laughs> the participants do not need the research. Um, and which is why there's a higher threshold for research versus treatment. I guess the gray area then becomes with a lot of these sort of, again, around the area of advanced therapeutics, where sometimes, you know, the, the clinical need and the research is combined. You know, the only way you can access a particular medication is through a clinical trial. Um, and so then I think it would just be a little bit more blurred. But I think for most cases, we do have a higher threshold because, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think you, I think what you've said is, is absolutely perfect because, I mean, the goal of treatment is to benefit the person and usually the goal of research is to actually benefit the researcher or to gain knowledge. I, when I say to benefit the researcher, it's to gain knowledge. So I think the two have to be clearly differentiated. Um, but, yeah, with advanced therapeutics, um, I think, and I think we've got another case study that we'll look at next, I think it comes down to risk-benefit, doesn't it, when there's no other option. But with this one, uh, I could not see there would be any reason why the family should not be involved in this, unless, unless it was detrimental. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on to that um, in, a, in a couple of slides. Will, I see you've got your hand up too. Oh, no, all I was going to say, and you've just sort of said it, was the, um, does, would they take into account in that risk-benefit analysis of the risk of the, the harm to the relationship of that family if the participant was to join and then the family to find out later? So... I guess that would be taken into account where if it's if it was beneficial to the participant and it helped them, but then the overall sort of net effect was a disrupted family sort of situation. I suppose that would have to be taken into account. I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, th I think when you look at, in fact, we're, you know, I'll show show you. Well, I'll show you in a minute what you know what a young person can consent to their own participation is. It certainly it is sep um, it is defined that if the family if the child is estranged or separated from the parents or it's contrary to the best interest of the young person to contact the family, yes, they could be. But usually that's only with low risk studies. It's it's not with the high risk study. And I mean we don't know enough about this case here with the case study to actually to find out. I think the purpose of it was to actually show that when you're getting treatment, yes, in New South Wales, a 14-year-old can um, accept treatment, but a, um, a, to actually participate in a study would prefer parental, well, it's, it would be in this situation appropriate to get parental um, approval, as, as much as we know of this case. And I guess, Will, the other thing is in a clinical trial, we, we don't know if the product is going to benefit the, the participant. So I guess that's why they're doing the clinical trial. So we can't, we can't actually say, well, you know, this study will benefit the participant. We, in, in a research setting, setting, we'll never be able to say, you know, the, the research will, you know, benefit the participant. Thank you. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Sarah and Azra, there are a couple of comments in the chat. So one is, wouldn't it depend at least partially on the child's ability to comprehend and who will be assessing the child's understanding of the research and risks? And um, the other one, I'll just give you quickly, is um, that the fact that the person doesn't want to discuss the depression with his parents means he's extremely vulnerable. So having, and I'm sorry, Corinne, you might need to stop in, because so having it as an opt-in flyer would have been less evasive. Not sure. If yeah, sorry. So just like an option, you know, sometimes with research, um, it's not necessarily like a face-to-face -face question saying, do you want to do this research? You know, there's like flyers available um, with a bunch of handouts. And so it's really more on the person, like, oh, I can see that's available. Do I want to do that? Or do I not want to do that? I feel like that's a less evasive way, um, you know, especially for a child, if they do understand or don't understand, it's kind of more in their control rather than, um, you know, an adult sort of saying that they already trust, um, sort of saying it to them because they might be, I don't know, more... Um, more hesitant, more hesitant if it's uh, spoken straight at them rather than them seeing it or reading it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think they're, they're both very, very good points. Now, if we just sort of share the slides again. Th thanks. So, I mean, I think the comment about this case, I mean, I think all the comments we received are, are appropriate, but certainly in the case, a very brief case that we presented here, the, the researcher's view that he can participate um, is, is not correct. And I think as Amane pointed out that research and treatment, are, you know, they're very different. You know, the goal of treatment is always to benefit the patient and the goal of research is to discover new knowledge. And I think there'll always be competing ethical interests, um, namely the completion of the research it can be complete, um, can compete with the care of the patient. And, and I think we've also discussed the decision to participate in research can be more complex and require a greater level of confidence and understanding. Ezra, do you want to go on to the next slide, please? Um, so, and I think it's also been brought up in discussion there that it does depend on the nature of the research. Um, and it depends on the nature and the complexity of the research. Um, 
And I think this is what you're saying, Corinne, that a 14 year old's consent may uh, alone may be adequate in a different study. Um, say, for example, a low negligible risk study when it's completing an anonymous questionnaire or it didn't actually require um, an experimental um, experimental drug. But as I said, we're very limited on the information we have in this case study, so it, it's difficult to make a decision. But I would say, generally speaking, if the child is 14, we would expect parental or guardian um, approval to participate in the study if it was more than greater than low risk. And the national statement, um, 4.2.9 does provide guidance um, and a the child is mature enough to understand the information and consent and the research involves no more than a low risk and then this, this is the point I think that um, we're always making I think that the young person if the young person's um, the young person is estranged or separated from parents or guardian and provision is made to protect the young person's safety security and well-being in the conduct of research or it would be contrary to the best interests of the young person. So there are sort of situations where studies could go on. And I think m &A, you know, with the early phase clinical trials, when there's no other option, and I think that does come down to a risk, um, risk benefit, um, respect, it comes down to the risk and the benefit of this particular study. Does, does anybody want to make any comment about that case? Story, that case? John is suggesting in the chat that maybe a middle yeah. ground. I, I can't chat. Can you? Uh, so I'll read it to you if you like. So um, maybe a middle ground, they inform the parent that the child wants to participate and are they having are they comfortable with the child being consented? I, I mean, I, I think that's very good. In, in the particular case study we presented, that the child did not want to actually let their parents no, talk about their treatment. Um, but yeah, ideally, um, that's the ideal situation that the parent, the child or the young person themselves puts their hand up and speaks to their family about it and they all agree. And I think that's the ideal situation. Lucia, I can see you've got your hand up. Thanks, Sarah. Um, can you hear me okay? Sure. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, um, the, in this case, the child, um, you know, doesn't want to talk to, about with his parents, but in the national statement, you said that there's some provisions um, where it would be in the, you know, not in the best interests of the child for, for parental consent to be obtained. So can there be occasions where it's done on a case by case basis within a trial? I, I mean, I, th I think all ethics has to be done on pretty much on a case by case basis. Um, could it be done? I don't know. I haven't heard that one so again. Whether you, I, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so in the in the current version of the national statement, clinical trials by design are considered to be greater than low risk. And so these, um, so the national statement at the moment only allows a child to consent to their own participation if the study involves low risk. Anything more than low risk, it requires parental consent. However, in the new version of the national statement, which will be in effect from next year, um, they've changed the definition of low risk studies, um, and that could include um, clinical trials. So the definition of low risk is going to be um, anything basically that involves only um, like this, like um, inconvenience or discomfort. Um, but I guess um, anything involving um, an investigational product like a drug will continue to be um, considered greater than low risk. So legally and from a national point, a national statement point of view, um, any um, any clinical trial involving an investigational product, um, we cannot have the child to consent to their own participation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's right. Natalie? Yes, hi. Um, my um, comment relates to what Lucia just said then, but um, I, the way I read that statement about the, um, the provision made was um, that in the case that it, there's estrangement, that there is other provision made to for the protection of the child. So whether that's the appointment of a guardian or, or whatever, who's, who's able to speak on behalf of the child's safety, that's how I read it. I mean, I think I think that's that's correct. I mean, it's separated from parents or guardians. So I think what it's trying to do, it's sort of if you're separated from a mature or an adult, then there is provision. Does that, that some other provision has been made? Yeah, that some other provision has been made. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I guess, again, um, I'm emphasizing it's depending on the level of risk of the study. It's been answered. So, yeah, oh, we're okay. about emancipated minors. So, yeah, who are legally, you know, they're technically minors, but they are emancipated because they, you know, maybe 16 or 17 year olds who live on their own, have got nothing to do with their parents. Um, but I guess then that would be the strange and that would fall under that category. So, so I can provide an example for the group um, where like, so uh, like an example of where we, you know, we have approved a child to consent to, to their own participation. So there was a study where it involved um, uh, homeless youth um, who had been going to different community centers um, so they were homeless, they had, um, you know, uh, run away from home, had uh, been estranged from her, you know, their parents did not have any comments. And the study involved a survey um, of how easy they find accessing health services whilst being homeless as, um, as a, a young person. And, and I remember that um, they asked for those 14 um, between 14, well, 14 and above to consent to their own participation. And so their justification was that the research is low risk. The survey is actually not um, going to cause any distress. It's just asking them how easily they'll find, um, uh, they find accessing health services. And that, you know, actually the research was going to benefit that population because then they were going to use the results of the survey to, to make it easier for them to access health services. And then for anyone, um, for like, even those 14 and above, but also um, for anyone under the age of 14 and below, they were um, proposing that um, someone from that community center would be um, not as a guardian, but as someone who would be, you know, kind of um, looking after their interests and helping them um, decide whether to do the survey or not. So that's, that's an example of when we actually approved a child consenting to their own participation. Thanks, Ezra. Um, should we move on to the next case? The next case we were going to present to you was a TJ, a seven-year-old girl who was diagnosed with asthma at three years. Her asthma is moderately as moderate to severe, but it's well controlled. Um, she's on daily cortisocosaurier inhaler and a bronchodilator inhaler as required. Um, she needs to visit the GP two or three times a year, or it has been ED occasionally. She's healthy. She attends school regularly, involved in school sport, and TJ and the parents are invited to participate in a double-blind randomised control trial. The randomised control trial is to, to test the safety and efficacy of a new drug for asthma. It's a chewable tablet, one, um, one tablet per day, and it uses a completely different mechanism to any of the medication she's been taking. This study has been done in, three studies have been done in adults, approximately 550 adults, and it's demonstrated to improve asthma with few side effects. This randomized control trial she's got has got three arms. It's got a standard arm, a new drug plus bronchial dilator as required, or placebo plus bronchial dilator as required. The study is 14 weeks. Um, they're allowed no other drugs for asthma while they're on this study. They've got eight study visits where growth, bone metabolism, eyes, breathing, there'll be a blood draw. There's going to be no cost to the family. Um, transport to all visits will be covered and they'll get $80 for each visit, a total of $640 um, if, if the study is completed. So my questions to you are, what are the risks for TJ? Anybody want to put any comments? I, I can't figure out how to put my hand up. It's Pamela oh. here. Do you mind me just... <laughs> just not, like, a, not at all, not at all. I think it works I'm sorry, Sarah. Look, the That's risk right. for... I see this as a... The, the risk is that um, it for me, as a mother... I've got my mother hat on here. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's um, she, she is, you know, the what arm is she going to go into? If she goes into standard treatment, fine. Bearing in mind that she's doing very well at the moment on her current therapy, you know, what what's the driver here to mess this up or mix it up? 
um, because she would have to come off her steroids um, and that might and go on to the new drug and horrible horrors um, she might be on the placebo in which case and and, and and I have a big ethical issue over that and I see that a lot with we do a lot of Alzheimer's studies um, big you know drug trials at St Vincent's Hospital and oh my gosh you know that what these people get the consent um, and then the, you know what as, as, as cognition decreases, there's a person responsible, um, guardianship tribunal, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes these patients, there is a chance these patients could be on placebo. So that, I guess that's, the, they're my two issues. She's well. Um, she, if she gets the new drug, she's going to have to come off her steroids and she might be on the placebo. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So the, I think the risks are quite numerous. Does anybody else want to contribute to what the risks of this trial are for TJ? There's quite There's a, a lot of in the chat. chat. Um, one, of, one of the ones that hasn't been talked about is the potential for parental coercion because of the payment. That's that's right. Well, actually, that, that I mean, that, that's certainly a discussion that we have regularly. Um, and this is $80 per visit. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm interested. We often discuss how much is a reasonable amount uh, for payment, and I don't think there's any clear answer to that. Um, it often means one parent has to take the day or afternoon off work. Um, is $80 unreasonable? I mean, and I think you'd really have to know more about the situation to work out whether $80 was a reasonable amount for somebody to take the family off work. But I mean, if, if the family was in financial stress, it may be, um, it may be too much of a financial um, incentive to actually join up the study. Have John, John, is John, John, John. Yeah, can you see me and hear me? Yeah, I can, John. Yeah, so I'm a bit, <clears throat> I'm a bit worried about that eighty dollar payment too. Yeah. Um, I guess it might depend on whether. So this is a fourteen year old, so she might be, you know, if the hospital's near the school, she might be coming to clinics on her own. So yeah. that might may not be. So that may actually then be an incentive for her to participate, yeah. um, because there are no additional costs. There are no real additional costs for her to participate if she if a parent doesn't have to come or if you know the yep. parent doesn't take time off work but uh, I'd be I'd be concerned about her stopping her effective therapy absolutely I think that I think that's that's yep. that's the nub of this yeah and where the parent has to be involved and I, I think the the risk I mean I think the risks with this are, are, are far too, I mean, they're numerous. I mean, I think the health risks have been pointed out, but I think there's also the idea of missing school and the extra visits, um, the social and educational risks. There's a, a small risk with blood draw. If they're monitoring bone metabolism, there's a chance they'll also be exposed to radiation. Um, and, and why sort of really interfere with the child who's doing quite well? Yes. Was one of the reasons. And I mean, then that is sort of follows on. Would it be actually ethical to actually have placebo in this study? And I think well, the bottom, sorry. Well, well <clears throat> we'd be asking her to do what all patients are told not to do. Sorry, I missed that, John. We're, she'd be being, she's being asked to accept the possibility that she might be stopping yeah. effective treatment which she'd been told so this sort of count it's counter educational in this case yeah. you're yeah. seeing this girl is well controlled and you're saying oh it's okay to stop your drug um, because um it can give us a chance to find out if this new one works i, I think it's and there'd be a problem there'd be a problem getting you know the problem getting this drug through uh, the ethics committee so so i think you know, for an example like this, it's it's too complicated. Um, yeah. So it's not just about it's not just about consenting a minor. It's about you know this the trial design, the, the study design exactly exactly. Yeah. Anthea, yeah. you wanted to say something. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that um, I'm assuming this is the first time it's being tested in children as well. This particular product. Um, Sorry, what was that? 
I'm assuming it's the first time that this product is being yep. tested in children. Yep. Um, and just because it works in adults or has been shown to work in adults doesn't mean it's going to be effective in children. That's right. It's also something to take into consideration um, when thinking about trial design and the ethics and the risk of the study for this particular child. Yeah, I, I totally, Anthea. I mean, I, I don't think, um, well, to have a placebo, to be testing a new drug against a placebo, which is something to be shown to be work, is not ethical. Um, all new drugs have to be demonstrated against something. Um, all new drugs should be demonstrated about the best standard of care. So to actually take somebody off medication is just not ethical. And I agree with John, it would just never get through. My other comment would be that why try it on a seven-year-old when usually with something like this, when asthma is actually also seen in the teen years, why don't they actually look at the teenager group first? And I see, I think there was a comment there by Amine that, um, you know, if they could recruit children with poorly controlled asthma, it would be better. That's right, why sort of change somebody who's already got something that's working quite well um, to something that may not actually work at all and could be quite dangerous for the child? There's also a comment from Corinne. Um, so she says also when she gets older and becomes aware of all the details of what she was involved in, what if she wasn't okay with being involved now that she is an adult with her own understanding, beliefs, et cetera? Does that sit as a family matter or an ethical research matter if she's not happy that she has participated without a choice? I, th I think that that's a good question, Corinne. I think that would stand for all studies that um, all studies that we actually approve now that the adult is actually speaking on behalf of the child. Ezra, did you so, want to make a comment on that? So I was going to say the same thing. That's actually an ethical consideration in all pediatric research, not just this case. And I think to get around that um, at the moment, the guideline is, and I think that's um, in one of the slides that Sarah will go through um, uh, uh, like um, by the end of this uh, meet, uh, webinar, it's that you have to make a decision in the best interest of the child. So that's that's something that will uh, have to be, I guess, accepted for all pediatric pediatric research. But I guess the 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 few things to get um, around it is a the adults have to always make make the decision that is in the best interest of the child. And that's what the ethics committee should look at as well when reviewing the project. Will this be in the best interest of the children that will be invited to participate in the research? And then um, involve the children and young people in the decision making process as much as you can, depending on their, you know, their, their level of maturity and um, understanding. So, for example, for all the ch children, we always make sure that there is um, a section on the consent form for them to countersign the parent consent form. So, say if they've got the maturity to um, to have a discussion with the researcher and the parents about the research project and the research activities, we do always make sure that there is information sheets provided to like age appropriate information sheets, I should say, provided to the children and young people, and that there is an opportunity for them to countersign the parent um, guardian consent form. Um, I guess these are just a few strategies. Um, I can see John had his hand up. Um, Sorry, John. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> it was just to uh, say that, you know, a better, a better design would be to maintain effective therapy and either add either the new drug or a placebo. Um, but obviously that's not the question. <laughs> uh, we, we have another one that says, it, uh, I think based on what you were just saying, Ezra, that it also brings in the concept of uh, whether consent is static and should it be revisited throughout the course of the trial, especially for long-term studies that can be, that can be reconsented. Oh, absolutely <laughs> agree. Yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, this, this trial itself is only a 14 week trial, but certainly, um, the idea of reconsent, I think, is really important, and particularly when the, the young person uh, turns 18. Um, so if I asked you, we've asked, we've covered placebo, can the placebo be justified with children? And in this case, I, I can't see, can anybody see any reason for a placebo in this study? Unless placebo means that they just continue with their current treatment. No, 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 no. there is a standard care arm. No, placebo okay. is nothing. Okay. No, no placebo, definitely no placebo. Um, and I also ask if TJ was your child, would you give her permission to be in the study? Would anybody give permission for her to be in the study? 
Now you're judging our parental skills, Sarah. <laughs> Absolutely. I've got lots of no, no's and no's here. So I'll take no as the answer. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's a great study design. Um, okay, Ezra, well, does anybody want to make any comment, further comment about that? I mean, the, the other question is, is what, what if TJ is really keen to be in part of this study, but mum says no or dad says no? What do you reckon would happen then? No comment. So just can I say from a regulatory point of view, um, Sarah, if, so if, the, if, if it's a paediatric study and there is disagreement between parents and children about participation, again, the best interest of the child usually comes in play. Um, so like usually it's like if children say, um, no, I don't want to participate and the parents say you should, <laughs> I think um, that would be a very difficult um, conversation between the clinician <laughs> and the the, the family, but um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I yeah, I think the answer is no. Sorry, it's Pamela. You're still not able to raise my hand and figure out <laughs> the technology after all these years. I think that if the parents are against it, even though the child wants to participate, then I think the I mean that's where you can assert your rights. I mean that's going to get older. If you've got how old is she again? She's quite. She's very young. Yeah, this Sorry, is seven. I was, I kept on She's only seven. She's seven. Yeah. I mean, that's different. That's a different kettle of fish to a 13 or 14 year old, where there would have to be a more adult sort of adolescent type discussion um, and they'd be more aware of what's going on. But can I just just say something too? I have identical twins mm -hmm. and they were saw this twin study that was, was, was talked about on Insight, Jenny Brocky, many years ago. And, um, you know, we were keen to, we were sort of thinking, well, maybe we'll sign up for a, you know, I thought it was very interesting being a scientist and being sort of tracked in this twin um, sort of situation and, you know, should we sign up? And one of them was just really gung-ho and the other one was absolutely against it. So I just thought, and I, that what Azra was saying, the renegotiation of consent, if you, you do sign up for a study, I mean, they, we never progressed it, but it was interesting, you know, how someone as young as, you know, 13, 14 has very strong opinions. I know it's not really a hundred percent related to what we're talking about today, but I had two very different approaches and, it was just a real education to me that not everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think um, you do have to, I mean, as Emma has pointed out, you've got to defer to the parents. And, and I think certainly a discussion between patients and the treating clinician. I mean, one of the issues that we, we meet often is the treating clinician also happens to be the principal investigator of the study, which is why we always try and encourage a person who's not involved in their clinical treatment to actually do the recruitment for studies. Okay, look, Ezra, I think we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so when it comes down to the core values of paediatric research, they're in fact exactly the same for adult research. Um, we look at the scientific merit and integrity, and it, as I think Ezra said on numerous occasions, children should not be enrolled in a research project unless it's necessary to achieve an important scientific or public health objective concerning the health and welfare of children. Um, with justice and benefits, um, participation should be in the best interest of the child. And the research design should ensure the child's safety, emotional, um, psychological security and well-being, which is certainly the one, the case study that we put out, I don't think does at all. And the risk to which the children would be exposed to must be low if there's no prospect of direct benefit uh, for the enrolled child and certainly the benefit for the study again of the case study that we put forward was not clear. Um, we've also spoken I think a lot about respecting um, and consent. Respect for the dignity or well-being and rights of all children and young people must be demonstrated in our research and we've spoken a bit about consent, we've spoken about a lot about consent in the case of consent parents or legal guardians general provide legal consent to the participant of their child. And children and young people who have the requisite capacity and maturity to understand the nature of demands of research should be asked to provide their consent to participate in research. Next slide. So, I mean, I think at SCHN, for all our studies, we do ask for parent guardian information sheet. 
We ask if we've got adult participants which are over the age of 18, we ask for an information sheet for them. We also ask for a young person's information sheet and a child. Uh, we actually try and discourage the use of putting age groups on the young person and the child and what minimum age of the child we try to avoid as well. And we leave that up to the investigator um, because we really think this should be determined on a case by case bear, uh, case by case um, basis, and it's going to vary of the type of research and the level of maturity of the child participant. And I think you know when we started off talking about the definition of a child, I think it was really important to note that you know an eleven year old in one family may be completely different as far as um, maturity and capacity than an eleven year old in another family. Um, so we try and avoid age putting age groupings on them, but basically have one um, aimed at a, a child, one at a young person or a teenager, and also the adult participant, um, which I know the researchers find very hard to do. And I think we've also spoken about reconsent, that if a child becomes mature and competent to provide consent during participation in the research, particularly longitudinal research, the investigator should revisit the informed consent discussion and seek participants' written consent. We do struggle a bit with sort of the biobanks in particular, when we would really like the families to actually to actually get in contact with the family, uh, sorry, the, the researchers to get in contact with the families when the child does turn 18. But I think the logistics of that is are proving tricky at the moment, but I, I'm not too sure they should be with a lot of our web-based information. Um, Researchers should proactively document in the protocol, and we do expect them to see it in the protocol, how and when the consent will be revisited um, and what involvement the parents um, will have and how the transition will actually occur. So we actually try and get them to put that into the protocol, um, but rarely do we see it done, I think, very well. Asra, do you want to make any comment on that? Um, no, you've covered it very well, I guess. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I think it is kind of, it's not a new concept, but it's something that has recently come to light. And I guess a lot of biobanks and registries were set up not thinking about reconsent. And I think those are the types of projects that are struggling at the moment. Um, but like, yeah, uh, going forward, uh, we're trying to, for new biobanks and registries or longitudinal studies, um, we're trying to make sure that they proactively think about how can they set up a system that allows them to reconsent um, in the future? Yeah, thanks. Next slide. Um, just a word on privacy and, co privacy and confidentiality. Um, just like the adults, I think you've got to respect the child's right to privacy and ensure that their information remains confidential, as you would in the adult world. I think. The big difference here is that you've got to be mindful that assurance about confidentiality, confidentiality excludes explicit mention of the limits. And these are the safety concerns and the mandatory reporting that we have in New South Wales Health. So I think on our template for a child's information sheet, we actually specifically outline that, you know, all your data will remain confidential but there may be circumstances when we do have to share that information and that relates to the safety of you, the safety of others and any mandatory reporting that we might have to do. Thanks, Ezra. Any, so questions, we open it up for questions and comments. Any questions? Um, I'm just wondering in that um, statement of that the, in the ethics applications that there should be a comment about how the transition between uh, parental consent and the child as a participant, you know, uh -huh. subsequently becoming an adult participant, um, how that would be managed. I'm wondering what that would look like within an ethics application. How would that, what's an appropriate way for that to be described, you know, or what have you seen as, as would be effective? I I've already seen when it's been effective. <laughs> uh, we like to see it in the protocol. Um, we actually don't have a lot of, um, what's, what's the right word? We, we can't enforce that it is actually undertaken, though it should be undertaken. And I think really it's just the fact that the families will be approached when the child turns or around their 18th birthday um, to give the opportunity the child to reconsent 
to for their for their participation in the study. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Yeah, I, I get, yes, yeah, I suppose just as simple as that. So, so yeah. you know, how would it be worded to satisfy that requirement? Yeah, yeah. but that makes sense. Yeah, so, so Natalie, in addition to that, so what other, like, best practice is, um, so information sheet, the parent information sheet would have a statement saying, we will reconsent your child when they reach this age, whether it's 16 or 18, so that the parents know this will happen. Um, the other thing is that the, the the young person information sheet would kind of make a mention of it. That would be best practice. And then also there would have to be a system for, um, you know, so like, so how do you get it uh, triggered at the age of 18 or 16 or whatever age um, that this person should be sent? So usually um, we ask for a separate reconsent um, information sheet. So the information sheet would say, you know, you've been participating in this project, you know, you, you and your parent consented to it, but you've reached the age of um, like maturity uh, or like whatever term you want to use. Uh, we, we're asking you to um, consider the continuation of your participation in this project. Um, mostly, I think a lot of people at the moment use opt out because, um, you know, people move on and there is that um, risk of uh, people being lost to follow up. And so they might not have a problem with participating or the continuing participation. So at the moment, I think best practice is you try to contact them to the best of your ability. I think it's at least three times. And if you don't hear from them, um, that you can, can, you know, you can keep their data in the registry or biobank. Um, the other thing, one other thing I learned from Melbourne, so I think Monash Health it was, um, they had um, come up with this statement in the parents information sheet, which I, I think a lot of people are not very comfortable with, but um, it was a legal solution they had come up with. And so they had included um, a statement in the parent information sheet saying, this is a longitudinal study. Um, it is your responsibility as the parent to tell your child when they turn 18 that they are in this registry and that they can withdraw if they don't want to continue. And so they had put on the responsibility on the parent and guardian. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure how... Um, uh, favorable that would be viewed by the parents and guardians but um I think they um this was a few years ago but it was a legal solution they had come up with thank you well any other questions that people would like to ask no Okay. Um, Ezra, are there any more slides? <laughs> no, it was just our oh. contact details. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Meryl Lee, do you, do you want to finish up if there's no more questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic discussion. It covered a lot of ground and, and uh, there were some really interesting comments. I thought what just, I would just suggest that if anyone hasn't yet read the um, revisions to Section 4 of the National Statement, which are currently being consulted on, there are a number of things in there which I think do very directly talk to some of the things that we've been talking about today, which you may find interesting to have a look at. That um, consultation closes on the 15th of September, so fairly soon. If anyone wants to go into the NHMRC website and find the link, et cetera, to the documents, and, and it's an online uh, consultation, they ask very specific questions about what's going on in that new revision. And of course, you also touched on, which will be interesting to see as it, it gets rolled out next year, uh, the change in how risk is or considered, shall I put it that way, and the fact that, as Ezra pointed out, going forward, people in the not higher risk uh, categories will be perhaps looking at children in research, which wasn't necessarily the case in the past. So it's fantastic to touch on all of those things for this group, because I know this group has people who are currently in Atrex and currently in the lower risk committees as well. I'm going to try and share my screen. And if it works, there will be a QR code if anyone's interested, because leading on also from that conversation, our next session on the 30th of October is on registries and ethics review. And so we had it, you know, we, we touched on that today. Um, and uh, perhaps it's going to be 
So once the data is in the registry and the registry, uh, perhaps the participation has actually finished, but the data is going to be reused, I'm there, we, we touched today on the sorts of issues that then arise, uh, particularly in this case for children. So let me just see if I can share my screen and get it to move to the next one. There it is. So I just put that up. If you can see it, 